Bonjour. Quickly, let me double check what number podcast this is. It's been a while. Obviously, right now, reporting from the middle of the COVID pandemic. And this will also be available on YouTube. So if you're watching this on YouTube, you can check it out by podcast. If you're listening by podcast, you can check it out and watch it on YouTube. Okay, this is going to be part of season one. Not season two, season two is with guests, which I'm planning to get some on soon. This is episode 20, season one, the James Smith podcast. So today I'm going to be talking about some things that are going on in the world, just a basic update behind the scenes and delivering a podcast at the same time, because there's quite a few important topics that I've been wanting to talk about. Now, unfortunately, I had to leave my Bali challenge three days early. So for any of you that don't know, every three months, I take a group of my James Smith Academy members for an all expenses trip to Bali. It's not a retreat, it's like a paid holiday. It's more of the socializing, less of the training. They almost jump into the life of what Darren and I would get up to there, training in an MMA, training at an MMA gym, or you know, going to the beach for beers, for sunset, etc., etc. But I was feeling a tremendous amount of anxiety when we are in Bali. The first week with the challenge was fine, but I couldn't believe in such a short period of time how much the world flipped on its head. And halfway through the second week, I was in a position where I was genuinely worried about whether or not I would get home. So although I'm British and I'm a citizen of the UK, I spend a lot of time in Australia. I'm over here for work commitments, my business partner's here, my business is set up here, so I float between the two. But I'm not a resident of Australia. I'm a resident for tax purposes. The Australian government are perfectly fine taxing me here, but they won't let me live here permanently. Not yet. So when Canada closed its borders, I was in a bit of a predicament where I was like, hold on, other countries are gonna follow suit. And if I can't get back into Australia, where my bedroom is, my stuff is, my housemates are, where I pay rent, where am I gonna go? Going back to the UK, in this period for me, would have meant moving back in my parents. Not only would that present the risk of infecting my parents with a potential disease that I might not know I have, it's also a bit like going back in time to my early 20s. It's not exactly gonna be a fun time at home and having a barbecue outside each night with the Smiths. This is the same week where people couldn't even buy toilet roll. I can't help but think that bog roll was maybe one of the most obvious ways for us to determine how our mindset works in turmoil. Look after ourselves, don't worry about anyone else. And it was pretty disgusting to see people hoarding so much stuff and seeing elderly people in supermarkets without their essentials. They might not be up to date on social media like we are and you know, watching borders close. They might be going for their normal shop going about their day and they can't buy anything because the younger generations were stupid about it. Now for me, if Australia was to close its borders onto me, which they did two days after I got back, I'd be stuck in limbo where I'd be in Indonesia where I very much doubt I would have been able to get the health, I or you know, I'd be able to get the medical attention required if something bad was to happen to me, or go back to the UK, which was locked down a few weeks ahead of wherever else I'd go in the world, like Australia where I'm recording this. I moved back in with my parents, put them at risk. My sister's pregnant, putting her at risk. It wasn't really a decision that I took lightly, so I had to cut the trip short for myself by three days. My existing members stayed there in their villa. They had a good time in isolation, had a lot of bintangs, went to a couple of beach clubs. But they were going to be okay getting home because of their visa status. Being citizens, no country, I believe, has shut its border to citizens wanting to go home. So I get back to Sydney, no going outside, no socialising. I'm very grateful to be back. Uh, I live with a couple of housemates, I've got my stuff here. Even just having this beanbag to sit on and a TV to watch and play PlayStation on have been hugely important to maintaining my mental health during these times. We're gonna talk about that a little bit in this podcast as well. We're four days away from April where I had planned a trip to LA. It's kind of a, a little bit deflating, but I'm actually okay about it. Uh, from my book deal, in a way to celebrate, I was taking all of my friends to Coachella for a trip. So I bought the hotels, the villa, the tickets to the event, everything, and that was postponed. And I'll be honest, at first I was really annoyed that it was being postponed, but what I can only explain is my perception of this whole thing was wrong to begin with. And I concede on that, I take a step back, 
I was getting my information from poor sources that would lead me to make a poor judgment on how I approached the whole thing. I think it's important I get that off my chest and tell people. I probably lost about £5,000 through that trip, but honestly, I'm not that annoyed about it because I understand the, the gravity of this situation in which we're facing. Little book plug, support your local bookstores by buying Not A Diet Book by James Smith. It's currently out now. In all seriousness, big thank you as well to everyone that has bought the book. I haven't done a podcast since it's been released. My mind has been blown by the amount of people that have bought it, read it, supported me through what I had to say. I won't lie, it's done a lot better than I ever expected, but on the same sense, I didn't expect it to do well at all. When I wrote the book, it was all about just writing it. I never thought about people actually buying it, if that makes sense. So people are like, oh, is it done as well as you thought? Well, in my head, I still can't fathom the fact that people have bought it. But yeah, if you are going to buy it and you haven't bought it or read it yet, you can get it on Audible as an audiobook, which I narrated, or you can get it from a bookstore. Do support your local bookstores because the foot traffic through those businesses, I can only imagine, is non-existent right now. So yeah, I'm in day seven of my uh, self-isolation quarantine. And do you know what? Today's probably the best I've felt the whole way through my quarantine. I probably got to it a little bit earlier than most people listening to this. And yeah, I've had a big change in my perspective with regards to the coronavirus. In the onset, everyone was kind of putting it out there that it's just a flu, and unless you're incredibly uh, elderly or hugely susceptible to it, you'll be fine. And I couldn't believe that people were hoarding from supermarkets for something that would just feel like a flu. Now with what's gone on in Italy and Spain, I think it's a big awakening to us that it's not just elderly people from a smoking background that live in parts of China that are gonna be affected. So for me, that was a big wake up call. There were three fantastic podcasts, one of which on Joe Rogan, two of which on Sam Harris, Making Sense podcast, which were really groundbreaking for me to understand this whole notion of flattening the curve. Social distancing isn't something that's ever come up in life before for me, so it was very new. I was like, hold on, what does this actually mean? And it's not about shutting our lives down, it's about spacing ourselves from each other so that the virus cannot do its thing. And for a footnote, before I talk about coronavirus a bit more, which I'm sure you're sick to death of, I really wish the whole world could appreciate two things. One, you are probably going to contract the coronavirus in the coming months. We need to stop acting like, you know, being selfish and self-centered and, you know, Acting like idiots is gonna stop you completely from getting it. We're trying to slow it down, not prevent it. And the second thing is that we are all going to die. And I feel that whenever there's a pandemic like this, everyone loses sight of that. And I think it's important, not in a negative aspect, to understand that we are all going to die. What we're looking to do is prevent people dying before their time is up. And in a post I tried to get the point across, I don't think I did it too well, of saying that I'm, hugely grateful that younger generations are not as poorly affected as the elder. If we had the choice of picking people in the middle of their lives, the end of their lives or the beginning, I'm grateful that it is towards the scale of the more elderly. Um, some people skewed that into, James, you want people to die. And I'm like, well, that's not quite what I was saying. So social distancing about, you know, reducing the amount of people we're in contact with in confined spaces. If people had done that better and taken it to heart, more seriously, we wouldn't be, I don't think, experience the lockdowns in the way in which we are. The way that so many restaurants and pubs and bars are being closed because people couldn't really stick to it. And now I'm fully behind all of these movements where before I was like, what the fuck, Corona, Coachella's been canceled, oh my God. But now I fully appreciate it. And I think the younger generations are really showing the fact that they're naive. And do you know what? If I was 18 or 19 at spring break in America, I could probably be guilty of it as well, but now I'm a little bit older and a little bit wiser. So this is my first time being isolated and being kept from the world in 30 years. I've never, and no one else has really experienced anything ever like this, which means there's going to need to be some form of adaptation, not just by me, but you and everyone. Everyone is in this struggle together because no one's had to do this before. Even if you served time in prison, at least you were in an environment of people that were familiar with what was going on. Now, with the travel bans, and I understand why borders have had to tighten up things. Unfortunately, some of my housemates' mates got sent back to their home countries, although they live here, they have jobs here, they have flats here, even have girlfriends here. And I think that although a few of them managed to appeal and get through, 
These travel bans to me are more like political agendas so that people in their countries can feel safe. Looking at the statistics though, banning 90% of travel won't even buy you an extra fortnight before you experience the peak of that pandemic spread of disease. So although reducing travel will help, I don't think locking people out of their own countries where they live is really much more than just making the public feel safe. And you know, banning the majority of travel is like spitting on a house fire to put it out. I don't think it really gets to the crux of the issue. And my annoyance was in the fact that when I got back to Sydney, I was in a 14 day stay in your room, don't go outside. And I'm still doing that now. I've gone to the shop to get bog roll. That's about it. And I've now got social anxiety when I go outside that, you know, I might be texting a friend or I might lean on a wall, you know, because my friend says, oh, I need to get bog rolled as well. Someone's going to take a picture and report me going, James Smith, Daily Mail Australia doesn't respect the coronavirus. He's out there spreading, Ugh. you know, and that gets in my head. I'm worried about going outside. I even got nervous sitting on the step to my house in case someone goes, oh, he's not, you know what I mean? But what annoyed me was the day I got home, day one of my ban, people were still out and about. In Bondi, the Friday night, day two of my ban, there were thousands of people on the beach socializing, having picnics, going on day trips. And I was there like, why am I stuck in my room? Because I went on a plane when everyone else is out there allowed to socialize. And I'm now nearly at day eight, no symptoms, no problems. And I was pulling my hair out as to why I nearly got locked out of the country in which I'm residing in right now, but I can't even go to the shops without facing, you know, repercussions for it. And that was hugely frustrating to me. And that annoys me. It made it worse that I could open my window and hear people out drunk partying, having a good time. I've been on a plane. I can't go out, yet people out there are allowed to go fucking snog a load of people in bars. It pissed me off. It was kind of like a bit of double standards. So you know, you've, been on a, you've been on a plane, stay in your room, but you haven't been on a plane. You go out, you enjoy yourselves. Now, a lot of people straight away are gonna be like, oh, James, you're not going home to see your family. And I was like, well, I don't wanna put them at risk, but also I don't wanna put myself at risk, not for even coronavirus, but for mental health. And something that I probably need to speak about more is that over Christmas, I was at home for two months uh, with my family over Christmas, with the book launch happening, it didn't make sense for me to leave and I had to swap visas in Australia. And I'd go as far to say that the period of Christmas was the lowest I've ever felt mentally for the entire year, maybe even longer. And not that I was depressed, I just wasn't very happy. And I had all these very, very strange thoughts in my head as to, I have so much in life, I have so much to look forward to, my work's going so well, why am I not happy? And it was to do with my environment and how I was perceiving my environment. And it was very difficult for me because I was in the bedroom which I grew up in, uh, where I'd been so many times before. And I'm in this bedroom and I can see, you know, I'm almost jumping back into my old life and that, that didn't stimulate me from a mental standpoint. I didn't have my place where I'd record stuff. I didn't have uh, good lighting or anything like that. And it massively affected me. I, you know, I wasn't getting out of bed till like 10 a.m. And I didn't want to go back to that. I didn't want to subject myself to that. And you could argue that that is a selfish move from me. And it absolutely is because it's imperative to me that I remain above water. Everything else comes second to that. And I love my family and I'm very, very close to them. But there's no point me prioritizing how they're going to feel and neglect myself in the process. And that's something everyone needs to appreciate. And I've said this with relationships before. Look after yourself and do whatever it is and what's important to keep you happy then your partner should be doing the same and you both should be sharing your happiness together. Now, if you pursuing happiness rubs your partner the wrong way, you're in a toxic relationship and I would advise you to get out of it. Not only that, but this last Christmas to me was, the only, was probably the first Christmas I've been single for quite a few years. And there's certainly a stress surrounding my relationship status, not only uh, with regards to COVID-19 and in current isolation, but within my professional life and where my professional life is. I've aired my laundry a bit on social media about how difficult it can be for dating, um, you know, and even people I've met on Hinge to on dates with, I've seen on their Instagram that they follow me and they've even mentioned me in their stories. But yet when I go meet them for an ice cream, they pretend like they don't know me. I don't like this dynamic and I'm not sure if it's an awkward dynamic or they're intentionally being dishonest for a level playing field and I'm suddenly now worried about single people throughout 
this pandemic and dating is now out the window social contact is now out the window and if someone was feeling low at least before they could date and maybe share their emotions with someone over like a, a glass of wine or someone they was casually seeing but now if relationships fizzle out and dating in essence a bit like sales and marketing there's nothing coming into the pipeline not only are businesses going to suffer people's personal lives are going to suffer the same and that's an important kind of thing for me because my friends that do suffer with their mental health usually at least have partners who are supportive so there's uh, definitely uh, a kind of stigma that's going to be attached to anyone wanting to even go on a date in these period in these times now another thing on a side note which i want to talk about today is this spot on my face which i've named bruce bogtrotter the second during my lockdown people are now talking to me about my spot james you need to put toothpaste on it you need to put pseudocreme on it you need to do this you need to do that it's a fucking spot i get a spot maybe once every year and you know, granted, a year ago I had half my social media following I did now. This is normal. People get spots in stress, shitty diet, whatever it is. And the amount of fucking people trying to give me advice, it's no wonder people have issues with cellulite and scarring and stretch marks. They're fucking normal, and so is having a spot. You need to pipe the fuck down about giving me advice about my skincare routine. Just because I have a large social media following and I vlog or whatever it is, doesn't mean I have to be perfect and you know I could have put concealer on this or whatever it is that you put on to cover that stuff but that would be disingenuine to me being myself so those of you giving me spot advice back in your fucking box there's no need it's normal right calm yourself yeah and people going oh keep the beard or oh, shave the beard or oh, and you know same respect if I was walking down the street oh change your hair color or oh, that dress is shit we need to have some kind of boundaries between this, all right? And I will enforce these shortly. Guess what? If I come out of this a little bit fat, I don't need you to tell me about it. If I have a spot on my face, I don't need you to tell me about it. Because guess what? I know there are mirrors in my house. So shut the fuck up. Thank you. In this, I'm going to be talking a little bit about how I've been managing my mental health, my health, or whatever. And firstly, a big shout out to uh, my first PlayStation in about 10 years. Uh, I got a PS4 to play Modern Warfare, to play Call of Duty. For me, if I'm going to be forced to live the life of what I did as a teenager, I might as well really dive into it two-footed. And buying this, if I'm going to be stuck in my room, make this work. I thought to myself, when, when was the last time I spent 20 hours a day in my room? By gaming years, when I was 19, 20. So I was like, if the wind's blowing in that direction, you might as well kick with it. Because to me, my routine has been taken away from me with what's going on. I can cry about it or I can try to overcome it. I'm not going to be able to go to jiu-jitsu training. I'm not going to be able to do coastals or, or currently right now I can't even go for a walk and listen to an audiobook. So I'm replacing that time with PlayStation. I'm slotting in new things. And although from the outside people could scrutinize my productivity, it's an integral part of me remaining busy. I have a very busy mind. I need to be distracted. Which brings me on to another um, footnote of this discussion. Someone in confidence said to me the other day, I could potentially have undiagnosed ADHD, which I will be looking into, as well as getting a therapist. Because with the ADHD thing, I could be portraying some of the symptoms. But also, as far as a therapist, I spoke about this in my mental wealth podcast. My mental health is great, and I am incredibly grateful for the people around me for ensuring it remains that way uh, because my mindset is very easily influenced by these people but at the same point I feel it's very important I become proactive um, you know a bit like let's say I start to feel a little bit of a niggle in my knee I want to see a physio straight away and identify what that is before it becomes a more serious injury and I implore you lot to do the same Therapists right now, even if it's a phone conversation or whatever it is, I'm going to find one soon. I'm going to start making these points of contact and I'm going to get tested for potential ADHD. But that's just a footnote. Back to the conversation. I've got a bit of a beef with social media right now. My peers, in fact. And this is what my issue is. Everyone, whatever industry you're in, there are people that need your help. They have problems, you have the solution. If it's a leak in your bathroom, you get a plumber. If it's a hole in your wall, you get a builder. If it's to do with your health and fitness, you get a personal trainer, etc. And 
People now are jumping to social media to put arbitrary random workouts for people to follow. And although you could, yes, argue that that is better than nothing, we've completely sidetracked the entire point of problem and solution. People's problems were not that there were not enough free workouts. There have been free workouts on YouTube for a very long time now, easily maybe even a decade. What the problem people have is accountability, knowledge, requiring a coach, someone to talk to, someone empathetic, someone to vent to, someone to provide a structure, a program, something to follow, something to be accountable to. People's problems haven't changed. The solution remains the same. People, I believe, are now jumping to the public, presenting these randomly compilated workouts for engagement. They're seeing a trend and they're trying to jump on the trend based off engagement, likes, views, follows, subscribers. And to me, from an ethical standpoint, I don't like that because they are trying to make advantage from the current state of the world with COVID and everything that's going on. Instead, I wish they would just stay doing what they were doing, thinking up the problems, presenting solutions. If they're doing that, I do not have a problem. But putting random workouts for people to follow once, to me, just annoys me find people's problems, present them the solution. Whatever business you're in, that is my bit of advice. What do I post for content? Do that, I've been doing it for years. And I'm not going to change who I am or how I conduct my business or how I help thousands of people based off a global pandemic because their problems have remained the same. They're just in a different environment. Now, some people off the back of this have said that I'm very negative. Now, I'm not a negative person. I do not have a negative mindset. I feel the person saying that probably does. Something that's very important to understand is that nothing in life is negative unless you see it as negative and you absorb it and you take it in as negative because anything negative can have a positive. James, I was cheated on. Well, isn't it wonderful that you found out about it because you could still be with that person if you hadn't. What a great opportunity for that person to bolster your confidence in your decision that they're not right for you. If we really look at worst case scenario right now for everyone, if you have running water, you should be fine. Most of us have got six months to 12 months of body fat on us, and with running water, you can drink it and wash your ass with it when you run out of bog roll. We will survive through that. But one thing I can't stand is false positivity, which again is on social media and it's driving me insane because people are putting this facade on of how, oh guys, welcome, today we're going to be doing another home workout. Things are shit right now. We're being confided to our homes, we cannot socialise, we cannot date, we cannot really leave our houses without some kind of anxiety as to why we're leaving our house and we need to appreciate that things are shit and saying that is not negative. I've lost followers over my standpoint on this but I will not compromise how I feel about these emotions. Let me explain. I am not anti-happiness, but I'm not gonna push aside my normal emotions with regards to what's going on in the world to embrace false positivity. I won't do that. Because by doing so, we lose the skills we need to deal with the world how it is, instead of how we would like it to be. When people embrace false positivity, they are suppressing emotions. They are burying them down. They are taking all the things that are bringing them pain and they're trying to park them. They're trying to get them out of their life. They're fucking pushing them under the carpet. And that is not good. When emotions are put aside, suppressed, hidden, they become stronger. That's the elephant in the room with false positivity. In psychology, this is called amplification. We're all feeling it right now. If you have something hedonic in the fridge, let's say it's some sweets or you've got some ice cream in the freezer, whatever it is, you see it and you're like, not having that, it's 9 a.m., not having it. You go away, you sat on the sofa, you're a bit bored, you think about that, no, 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 don't think about the ice cream, don't think about it. And suddenly before you know it, it's become enlarged in your brain. The more you've tried to suppress it, the more you want to eat it. You go in, you end up eating your ice cream at 10 a.m. this morning. I know because I did that yesterday. And that's why I always have to speak out. I always have to say what I'm thinking. I will never, I will never suppress my emotions because I, I know how much they'll be amplified in my mind. Right now, I'm currently going through two legal cases where people are trying to sue me for doing so, for speaking out. And this is the price I pay for being who I am. There's a chance that if I wasn't this person, you wouldn't be watching this or listening to this right now. And 
people trying to sue me for defamation or whatever it is, I was literally just speaking my mind and my honest personal opinion and people try and take me down for that. But to me, I would rather face the implications of these legal lawsuits than suppress it and pretend everything's fine. When someone's trying to mislead someone for financial gain, I won't stay quiet. They're impressionable teenagers. There are people who I was 10 years ago that didn't know what they were doing. I've got my sister, even my future generations, when I have kids, when I'm older, these are who I'm looking to protect. This is why I speak out. This is why it's important to me because if I suppress that, it's not gonna be good for my mental health and I remain selfish, always prioritizing my mental health over anything else. And I suggest you do too. And I know and I can appreciate that a lot of personal trainers right now who are pro promoting and doing these workouts may not be in a good place, but people will not pay you for free workouts. They're free. And also the people you attract whilst promoting free workouts are people that just want free stuff. This does not promote or build your business, it builds your following. And that is a metric to success which isn't ideal in any current state. If you have all the followers in the world of people that love free stuff and no one's buying your product, you will not survive in the industry. You need to remain doing what you're doing, providing a service that's paid for and attracting people that are gonna pay you for your service. So although you might get butt hurt that I'm calling out home workouts, my intention in the back of my mind is to help you as well as the trainers to operate a profitable business through these tough times. Because guess what? If this was my first year of personal training and COVID came along, I probably would have gone out of business. So trust me, I care. And I'm running a support group as well, trying to give information for exactly this, but your free workouts are not helping you and you are trying to operate a business and if you help yourself enough you will end up helping the people that come to you for help so there's your little business to business spiel if we park false positivity to the side and bring a bit of perspective which is a very powerful tool for my mental health perspective let's not remain positive it's shit people are dying people are suffocating in hospital some elderly some young some with pre-existing conditions People are spreading the virus unintentionally. Some are being reckless, some are remaining naive. There's not a lot we can do about that. So things are shit. But I wanna tell you with a bit of perspective, they could be a lot worse. Scenario one, you contract the disease and you're one of the very small percentile of people that at a young and healthy age, go to hospital, you have to be put in a coma and given a ventilator so you can breathe. Scenario one. Scenario two, you work in the medical industry as a nurse, a doctor, or even any field where you're required, paramedic, ambulance drivers, etc. You have to go to work for long shifts every day, barely get any sleep, and you're subjected with not only people that are crippled by COVID, but those that aren't, that feel the pinch, heart attack, stroke, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, type one and type two. And you're not only juggling the people that need your help, but the people that need your help with COVID. You're also being subjected to the reckless, the young and the naive and what their implications are doing to the general public. It's number two. Number three, you're asked to stay at home. You're bored. You're in self-quarantine. Given the opportunity, myself included, I think we've got the good brunt of the deal here. And with the perspective of working in hospital or being in there as a, as a patient, we've got a pretty good deal and we need to be positive about that because no matter how you feel, we have the best deal here. And if everyone being subjected to COVID right now could put their problems in a pile, you'd probably take your own back. So that's something to be positive about. Now staying at home for this amount of time to a lot of us is gonna feel very alien. It's gonna feel very new. But at the same time, this has been people's lives a little bit more extreme for quite a long time now. A lot of my online clients are single parents that have got duties to look after young children and they're making it work and they were making it work before COVID. They got a home gym set up, they got a suspension trainer, they did their workouts, they got their steps up around the house. They took phone calls with headphones so they could potter about cleaning the house at the same time. Although this feels very new to you, it's not very new to people and I've had thousands of clients who have made this work so there's no reason that you can't make it work. It's just adapting to it and understanding this is gonna be the norm for a bit. Now, I hate it when people uh, have the spiel of, you are not alone, but I do feel that there's certainly an element of togetherness with this. And the best way I can explain this is, you go on holiday, or I go on holiday, and I'm in Spain, and I'm in a bar, and I chat to someone, he goes, I'm from Ascot. I go, no way, I'm from Ascot. You know when you meet someone on holiday, and you're from the same place. 
you're from the same place and suddenly you have something that makes you connect you in common you're like dave oh my god she's just she's literally like two miles from my house she's just two oh my god that's amazing suddenly your friends warm up to them before you know it you're in a big friendship circle and all you had that brought you together was where you lived it didn't make that person safer you don't know that they're not a flipping serial killer you're just from the same area but when people and humans have something in common it brings them together I guarantee that even if you see someone in a car park that has the same car as you, you're more inclined to let them out or to, you know, help them, whatever it is, have that space. You you, know, you have it. Go on, you take that one. I'll get another one. So at least as a society, as a nation, as a race, we are coming together more. And I can feel this. People nodding as they walk down the streets or I chatted to my neighbor for the first time the other day. I just said, how's it going? How are you coping with this? We suddenly have a united problem. And that is a very powerful thing that we all feel this together. And although we can feel very alone and very alienated at home, as a species, we are getting closer together. And we all feel that. We're just not talking about it. My, the most important thing that I can get across in this podcast and YouTube video is that mental health comes from the inside we can't look to be influenced by things around us to make us happy you know we that that discussion must start in our own minds we must use perspective to realize we don't have it that bad and we must appreciate that nothing around us is negative unless we choose it to be negative if you are feeling negative emotions right now it's because you have chosen to it is your perception on something even if someone says james you've put on weight well yeah i have had some time off training thank you for noticing I have been consuming a lot of calories. I've been really enjoying my food. Thank you for that. There are no negative things that people say, only negative thoughts to the way we perceive them. And that is a very, that's a hugely powerful thing to think about. We can change our perception of anything negative. I'm stuck at home becomes, I can see more of my family. I'm bored means I have more time to do things which I've been putting off for a while. And remember being bored is a feeling. Being stuck is a feeling, feeling down about your situation is a feeling and we need to feel things it's part of being human there's a lady on a ted talk called susan david and she said something very powerful where she goes if you don't want to feel this if you don't want to feel what's going on you don't want to feel sad you don't want to feel any emotions you have the same wants as what a dead person has and i think it's very fitting she says that only dead people don't get inconvenienced by feelings only dead people never get stressed only dead people never get broken hearts and only dead people never get the disappointment that comes with failure. But one of the most like uh, powerful things that she says is this. Tough emotions are part of our contract with life. And that discomfort is the admission to a meaningful life. That we cannot have a meaningful existence without some form of discomfort. And I said this in a post the other day that we cannot control what happens right now, what happens in the next week. We can barely control whether or not we can track the virus. We can do our best and, you know, the economy is going to face tough times. We're all going to go into a recession, etc. We can't control that. There's nothing we can do. You can't meditate and turn that around. But what we can do is control how we feel about it, how we perceive it, how our perspective of it is. And whether or not we accept that as a negative thought is completely up to us. We shouldn't just take how we feel as a be all and end all. We should notice how we feel and understand why we feel that way. And if you feel a bit depressed, a bit down, a bit unmotivated to train, uh, very unmotivated to track your food, that's normal. Why are you feeling that way? Because there's a global fucking pandemic that's keeping you inside and from doing what you'd like to do. It's normal to feel this way. To suppress these feelings of frustration like many people and my peers are doing is to suppress the very emotions that we need to take on as real we need to accept these emotions vent with these emotions and deal with how we feel about it not pretend they don't exist because pretending these negative emotions don't exist is part of the problem and i don't feel enough people appreciate that and one of my kind of final wrap-up points is come the other side of all what's about to go on whether you're in worse shape, you've got a crap haircut, you, you know, you've had a real tough few months, no one's gonna judge you for that. No one's gonna have a foot to stand on for judgment. Oh, you let yourself go a little bit. Oh, you're not looking too well. No one's gonna be able to do that. And we can't start creating anxiety over something that's probably not gonna happen. If you wish to work out and you feel motivated to do so, crack on. You wanna eat well, do so. You obviously have an obligation to do your fucking best. And I'm not asking people to do more than that. But if doing your best means coming out the other side of this five kilograms heavier with a beard, case in point me, then fine. 
but it's time to accept that and embrace that because feeling bad about it isn't going to improve our circumstance on that it's only going to worsen it and given the opportunity to come out of covid the fittest person or the happiest person you should be picking the happiest person i'll continue to get a little bit disheartened by people trying to cash in from the situation doing random workouts online to the masses that's fine let them do that but to me my main concern is surrounding mental health and people aren't connected to their own thoughts and instead they're connected to a fucking random niche workout thrown out to the masses in a bid to build engagement. And that is something that concerns me. Everyone's worried about their physical health and what fucking live stream to jump into and no one's thinking and absorbing their thoughts. They're suppressing their emotions to live in a world of false positivity which is only going to manifest over time. Now, I believe that exercise and mental health are intertwined, they're connected, but they're not be an all and end all entities. Out of my friends that have killed themselves, they were all in very good shape. Their six packs didn't save them from the fact that they were depressed, right? Being fit and healthy is going to play into your hand incredibly well with how you're feeling about yourself, your mood, your self-esteem. But ultimately, it's about doing what makes you happy. If you don't wanna train for a week, don't train for a week. If you don't wanna eat, fucking chicken and broccoli tonight don't eat chicken and broccoli tonight that doesn't mean go eat four tubs of fucking ice cream do what makes you happy but ultimately the most important thing through the next few months is that you remain level-headed that you have something to work towards which should not be perfection but it shouldn't have been perfection before any of this even existed we should be seeking progressions every day whether it's with your workout progressive overloading whether it's with a book aiming for a few pages whether it's for a step count, seeing how much you can move at home. We need to make sure our mind is occupied by some form of progression. That is imperative. But finishing this all with a six pack, getting disheartened over a few kilograms of weight gain, if you're like me, someone that prefers to use the gym, then you're setting yourself up to fail. Don't worry about anyone else but yourself. Don't succumb to false positivity and do whatever makes you happy through these times. COVID, statistically speaking, we're all safer than a condom this percentage chance of us dying or even being admitted to hospital is still significantly lower than the statistics for the efficacy of a condom. But that is not to say that we should not be practicing these measures which are being enforced. In the onset, naively, with the poor information that I was subjected to, I thought very much about survival of the fittest. Oh, it sounds to me like a 0.1% of the really weak people are gonna die in the extreme elderly. I was like, oh, you know what, it could be good, good to have a clear out. I was very wrong. The British economy could lose out on 400 billion pounds. And worst case scenario, imagine if that was 200,000 British people that died. What is 400 billion divided by 200,000? It's 2 million. So with that in mind, 400 billion divided by 200,000 is 2 million pounds per person, per fatality. We are, as a nation, as a society, taking that on the chin. Two million pounds per person. That is actually really fucking impressive. In a world governed by money, greed, and socializing, for people to experience that kind of sacrifice for life is very new, and it's again something to remain very positive about. I want people to continue to realize not only that the world is a, is a great place and it's continuing to become better, but we're only exposed to the bad things that happen. You only see intensive care units with people on ventilators. You don't see elderly people that survived COVID. In the world, we only hear about wars and political agendas. We don't hear about rates of famine going down, the rates of, you know, premature deaths from childbirth going down. We don't hear about less people living in poverty than ever before. We are only subjected to the worst and we must remain in this mindset that the world is a fantastic place and the sacrifice people are making to preserve the lives of many is still a very, very positive discussion. And in essence, with the statistical you know, anomalies, we are giving up a large amount of what is important to us for the generations above us that did the same for us. And like Piers Morgan rightly said, these elderly people were called to world wars and they did it without flinching. We're being asked to fucking stay at home and have a few fucking fortnights off the beers. I don't think it's a hard task to adhere to and people should be respecting that very seriously.
And it's not about ensuring no one dies and ensuring that no one will ever get it because people will die in life and people will get coronavirus. It's about doing our fucking best. And we can't become so far removed from everything else. With every task that I've ever set someone in life, all I've asked them to do is their fucking best. Because if you do your best, no matter what happens, you can remain happy about it. With this, self-isolation, quarantine, whatever you want to call it, just do your fucking best. That's all people are asking. I don't think that we need to be getting depressed and caught up about it. We need to appreciate why we feel that way, but then overmind that with the reason and the rationale behind why we're doing it. So from me, make sure you check in with your mates. Not all poor health is visible. We can test for COVID, but we cannot test for people that are potentially a week out from killing themselves. So it's important that you check in with your friends. People you haven't spoke to in a while, people that have gone quiet. If you want to work out, work out. If you don't, don't. If you want to lose fat, calorie fucking deficit. And understand that this social distancing is not social isolation. We have never lived in a world where it's so easy to digitally communicate with each other. So we have no excuses. Where one door closes, another opens. Less social interaction, more times to use the smartphones in which we love so dearly. We've never lived in a time where it's so easy to remain connected. And as long as you have running water, you are fine. So there's a lot to take in from that podcast, YouTube video, etc. But I feel like a lot of people needed to hear it. If you're watching this on YouTube, make sure you subscribe. If you're listening to it on a podcast, make sure you also subscribe. Make sure you share it with your friends. Potentially someone could need to hear this. And if you haven't bought the book, you should buy it. Thank you very much for tuning in. Massively appreciate it. I'll catch up with you lots in the next episode. See ya.